with a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe, seismic or small. It continues. Change is all around us, shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. Digitalization is disrupting traditional roles and enterprises across the industries. Traditional roles are getting eliminated or transformed to accommodate new next generation skills and roles. Also, hiring for digital roles is highly competitive with huge supply demand gap, time and cost overheads, and scales heavily tilted towards hiring wrong candidate. Reskilling can enable enterprises to provide viable career path for their employees significantly improve employee satisfaction, as well as reduce their cost of hiring by 50 to 80 percent. Drop has mapped over 4 million career paths and analyzed the Reskilling Propensity Index, RPI, for each role transformation. HR teams can identify most plausible short-term and long-term career trajectories for individual roles understand missing skills and certifications required for planned career progression identify courses or certification offered by institutions or e-learning platforms to bridge the skill gaps drop is an ai driven reskilling and talent intelligence platform that provides in-depth insights on the talent and location ecosystem to assist in enterprises in their talent initiatives Speed is the new currency of business. In the new digital economy, effective competition requires a balanced approach to deep digital transformation that drives direct business value. By combining frictionless technology delivery with deep industry expertise, Virtusa helps business move forward faster. We help our clients advance to their optimal business state and achieve quick and continuous return on their investments. Virtusa is an end-to-end -end provider, delivering the full spectrum of technology services for our clients. For us, over the years, our mantra has become very, very um, ingrained in what we do, and it's three words. One team, one effort, one win. How are we one unified force? When we talk about one team, what makes one team? And we'll obviously think about, okay, the vibrance probably make one team, but it's three parts to it. It's us as leadership, it's our team who are the vibrance, and it's our customers and our clients who are our partners. Collectively, we make one.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the U.S. edition of Zinov Confluence 2021. My name is Amy McWhorter, and I am delighted to be your host again today. Now, yesterday, we explored how digital technology investments, strategic digital partnerships, and centers of excellence will play a major role in enterprise growth in the new normal. We heard from industry leaders and global visionaries who shared their unique perspectives on formulating a winning strategy to come out ahead in the ongoing growth wars. Now today, we'll explore how companies need to revisit leadership, organizational culture, and employee experience to build a talent moat in the new normal. But before we delve into all that's in store for you today, I would like to thank all our partners, our platinum partners, Accenture, Drop, and Virtusa, and our gold partners, Tech Mahindra, and V2 Solutions for their continued support of Zinov Confluence. Now, remember, we'll be running some contests and polls throughout the day, so keep an eye out for those pop-up alerts. We do encourage you to participate for a chance to win some exciting prizes. Just remember to use the hashtags Zinov Confluence and define tomorrow in your social media posts. Now, if you happen to encounter any issues or if you have any questions on the platform, just send us an email at events at zinov.com or send a quick message in the chat section and someone from the Zinov team will assist you. Okay, let's get on with the show. To let you know a little bit more about what we have in store for you over the course of today, I would like to invite Nivedita Nanjapa, project lead at Zinov, to kick off today's session. Now, she leads three key talent programs at Zinov focused on compensation and benefits, employee engagement, and inclusion and diversity. Over to you, Nivedita. Thank you so much, Amy. Hello to everyone joining us. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you again to day two of Zinov's Confluence 2021, winning the growth wars. Over the last 14 years, Zinov Confluence has become synonymous with the congregation of global technology and business leaders, both passionate and driven to bring about change in the ecosystem. Yesterday, as Amy mentioned, we focused on technology, and today we will explore the talent blueprint in the ecosystem. Before we get into this particular thing though, here's a quick, highlight reel from yesterday. pandemic has helped the world understand and make remote work work. As we collectively explore what the future of work will look like in the new normal, one of the key defining factors will be the workforce, very aptly referred to as human capital. As we visualize the impending disruptions, the people navigating through them to emerge victorious on the other side are what we focus on today. We will be commencing today's sessions with a drop keynote on the future of work, Workforce 2030. Vijay Swaminathan, CEO and co-founder of Drop, will be talking about the role of humans in the age of algorithm and AI. Considering the immense space of innovation with human intuition being at the center of it all, how can enterprises work towards enabling Workforce 2030? 
This will be followed by a coffee chat on empowering the global workforce to innovate and scale where Siddhant Rastogi, Managing Partner and Global Head for Zenov, will be engaging in a conversation with Rohan Chandran, Chief Product Officer at Data Axel, and Ajay Kumar, Head of Engineering Services Americas for Tech Mahindra. Together, they will explore employee experience in the new normal, what is impacted by hybrid work, what has changed, and where and how organizations need to invest across the employee life cycle itself. We also have with us today a seasoned technology veteran, Jason Conyard, CIO VMware, who will be delivering our second keynote on building and sustaining high-performing teams in a hybrid work scenario. If you were wondering how one would combine a virtual workforce, the digital uh, HR teams, leaders, be in by ensuring all three groups are effective at the same time, and how essentially will high-performing teams successfully be nurtured, driven to accelerate innovation? You could actually not afford to miss out on this particular session. The next keynote is a topic very close to my heart, inclusion and diversity. We will be joined by Mary Fairchild, the Global Director for Diversity and Inclusion at F5. She will talk about inclusion in the new normal. As remote working continues to expand into hybrid working with increased reliance on virtual tools, HR leaders will have to be cognizant of new types of discriminations happening online. How do organizations ensure a fair workplace for all, use data to discover hidden inequities, and use technology to create, build a positive, diverse, and inclusive company culture? Hope you're all as excited as I am for this one. Our last session for today is a panel discussion on nurturing phoenixes, reimagining employee experience in the hybrid workplace. For this session, we will be joined by Vijay Shah, CEO and President, V2 Solutions, Vibha Mishra, Vice President, HR Head, Silicon Valley, SAP, Krishna Gupta, Chief People Officer, Fast Light Health, and Jonathan Siddharth, CEO and Co-Founder, Turing. This panel discussion would be chaired by Vamsi Tirukala, Chief Commercial Officer and Co-Founder of DROP. Do stay tuned in these eminent leaders exploring how to ensure employees' mental well-being, sustaining a positive mindset, and ultimately providing maximum assistance to employees at the right time is what we need to focus on. And to summarize day two of the Zeno Confluence 2021 US edition and deliver the closing note, we will be joined by Sangeeta Anand, principal at Zeno. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our platinum partners, Accenture, Drop, and Virtusup, as well as our gold partners, Tech Mahindra and V2 Solutions. None of this would have been possible without their continued support. And with that, and no further ado, it is time for the drop keynote on the future of work, Workforce 2030. Vijay, over to you. Thank you, Nivedita. I'm truly excited to be here. Thanks for joining me today. The concepts that we described yesterday, uh, Pari spoke quite a bit about the leadership attributes of future leaders. Praveen's panel highlighted the need for uh, low code, no code and citizens developers. And all these concepts have a common tag or common connect to the future of work. And when you look at future of work, we examine two types of components. One is, the anxiety around whether AI is going to replace humans, and also how can enterprise adapt what type of utilities they can put in place so that they can succeed and win in this new age of growth wars. Now, if you look at historically, the last two years with respect to the AI human collaboration has been phenomenal. In 2018, AARP, which is it stand, it used to stand for American Association of Retired Professionals. They changed their name to American Association of Real Possibilities. That sort of signaled that 
the concept of getting single dose of education early on in your career and leveraging that lifelong is probably over. Hey, even vaccine takes two doses for it to be effective these days. So we got to look at education as a continuous thing and learning as a perpetual component. And uh, this particular concept has been getting very popular in the last four to five years. And in 2014, Harvard psychologist uh, Dan Gilbert made a very, very, very famous TED talk. It has about 7 million views in uh, TED videos. And in that he said, in digital, digitally transforming world, we are transiting quite a bit. We are in a transient state all the time. That means humans are constantly evolving, constantly changing as they learn new things and acquire new knowledge. Now, my objective here is to give a perspective about future of work, what has been happening historically, and also give some of our real life examples of where we have made positive impact with organizations. Future of work itself is a very, very broad topic. So we may not cover all components. We'll be very rather clinical and focused on certain aspects. Now, let, me, let us look at uh, a little bit of what has happened in the last 20 years or so. The second age of AI, where people started looking at how do we put in AI tasks for automation purposes, really triggered a lot of anxiety when it comes to economic models. And there are any basic literature review, literature study, paper review would point out to a number of such anxieties, whether it is a negatively correlated agriculture output to the number of people employed, or the decrease in the cognitive task intensity of jobs for college graduates post-graduation. These type of studies are available in plenty. And to a certain extent, it is driven by our foundational belief that labor market is pretty much the sum of the jobs. For almost 100 years, we couldn't disrupt this notion that labor market is a sum of jobs, meaning as jobs increase, the labor market performs better. While that is true uh, to a certain extent, the MIT economists uh, post uh, 2008 took a slightly different approach. Uh, and this model, um, if you are tracking labor economy quite a bit, you will be very familiar with this model. This model is what we call as the ALM model, the three scientists who, economists who came together and defined this model. This model uh, kind of was an eye-opener in many ways because it said that while there is a negative correlation in certain industries uh, with respect to people employed and output, there is, when we look at the tasks in a more granular way, when we isolate the tasks of a job within cognitive jobs, manual jobs, and even further classify that to routine cognitive and routine manual, the cognitive non-routine jobs and the non-routine manual jobs are actually increasing. And uh, even uh, to a point like there is a distinct difference, di distinct rate of growth across those tasks as we are progressing in this AI human journey. And this, uh, even though it's a very simple model, it sort of opened up the minds of the professionals and start thinking machines not as a replacement to humans, but how do we put it together? How do we sort of integrate the human machine power and really stay focused on customer outcomes? And there are a number of such case studies around that. For example, if you look at the AI uh, breast cancer reduction effectiveness, it's about 92% a very well qualified, super talented oncologist would have an accuracy rate of 95%. But if you put the two together, the machine and as well as a qualified professional, the accuracy rate is almost 99.1%. That, that is just outstanding. Now, this is the kind of power as we look at the tasks in which AI can help and where humans can play a role the current future is truly, truly exciting. Now you have various databases, uh, whether it is on the healthcare, energy industry, retail industry, 
AI powered databases are available for whether you are a researcher or a field worker, AI is uh, truly playing a collaborative role. Now you are, um, you have ton of evidence of that already coming in. Like if you go to a store like Lowe's, you will be starting to see, uh, you could interact with a Lowe's bot that sort of eliminated a lot of the pain points in shopping experience. Customer experience management has just dramatically changed with AI arrival. The Lowe's bot, for example, navigates through, helps you navigate through the aisles and very precisely guide you on all the questions that you have. Now, another interesting thing that happened, uh, uh, it was actually uh, discovered by IARPA. But those, those of you who are not familiar with what IARPA is, Post the WMD Intel failure in the US uh, in early 2000, the United States uh, um, it, it government really felt that we have to do a lot better in forecasting. And as a result, they started this organization called IARPA, which is a crowd-based AI big data driven intelligence platform that would get data from different people. And there are some very fun stories if you want to check it out, where you can actually see that in many cases, the non-specialist who are not connected to the day-to-day -day intelligence work, they are better forecast when it comes to some of the political events. Why is that? The access to data and the access to the, the, the information that is available has just been tremendously disrupted. While that is a little bit of a side story, the main point I wanted to highlight is IARPA has been commissioning an yearly study on has our trust levels gone up when it comes to AI? And that's a very, very important change that we are seeing in the last two to three years. Um, and they partner with multiple universities to release this index on our trust level. And in the last two years, uh, barring some confirmation bias, uh, around uh, accounting for confirmation bias, our generally the trust levels of AI by humans have increased significantly, especially in the last two to three years. And intuitively that makes sense. Let's say you are sitting in, in your uh, uh, home and you want to change the thermostat uh, setting, you open up an app and you basically increase the heat or uh, decrease the heat depending upon you are neat and you don't actually walk to the thermostat and see whether that has been accomplished or not. Like something that you did maybe five, six years back. Now that type of trust actually means that more and more collaborative activities would come in and that would start impacting the job roles in a very unique way. Now, the my intention is not to show that the AI impact on jobs is not real. In fact, the hollowing middle is a real and clear signal that we got to do something different. And in any economy, in any society, um, the at the two end of the spectrum, which is pretty much a knowledge driven specialized jobs, they are normally safe, uh, I use the word normally safe uh, during economic downturns. Similarly, non-routine manual tasks, such as the caregivers, janitors uh, type of jobs, they are also to a large extent uh, safe. Um, who feel very anxious in an economy, when, especially when they hear tightening labor market type of scenario, or the people in the middle, the people who uh, are uh, call center supervisors, the people who are doing some project management type work or a program management type work, recruitment coordinators, a number of jobs in the middle, which is in between a cognitive and a manual layer. And that layer in any society feels a bit anxious. And we have done a number of interviews a drop to understand this phenomenon better. But um, you know, this is a real routine that happens in any downturn. And we are, the one interesting thing is uh, AI has the power to bring even um, that middle layer up. And we are beginning to see such evidence of how the cognitive component of the jobs can be amplified and the interpersonal component can be amplified, thereby a middle level, middle layer job like a call center job or a recruitment coordinator job 
can be transformed into a new type of a job. And th there are two types of transformation that happens. One is in, in, a, in a call center job, as we automate more of the contacts through um, you know, various uh, automation, you can, it, it, we see evidence, like especially in tech companies, in large tech companies like Microsoft, for example, the transition is happening more into inside sales jobs where you have amplified the capability, which is the ability to connect to customers through their remarkable call center experience. You have amplified that capability and you have repurposed it to do something different. This is beginning to happen. And the other thing that is beginning to happen is uh, the job itself, uh, the cognitive task within the job, you're still playing the same type of function, but you are uh, now uh, having a broader strategic impact. For example, recruiters, a lot of their candidate screening job is automated through AI, but now the biggest thing that many companies are working is recruitment experience management. How do we work with the candidates, not just the candidates who are selected, but actually candidates who are rejected? How do we work with them? to give the best experience possible. The whole concept of silver medalist uh, handling, silver medalist experience management is a new concept in recruitment. People who just couldn't make it to the mark, but uh, very, very valuable assets, maybe a year from now or a six month from now. And this is a fantastic change that is happening only because we are able to automate some of the routine tasks that the recruiters uh, would actually perform. Now, as we look through these transitions, the question that is in front of the organization is, how can we work with their hollowing middle? Every enterprise has this, um, you know, not um, um, the same effect that exists across the societies also exists within an enterprise. There is a hollowing middle which need to be paid attention to and totally uh, transformed into a powerful human capital. And also, how do we put ourselves in a perpetual learning orbit? And this is extremely critical for us to not only be ready for the future, but also dominate the future. Now, this is a very, very broad um, analysis. There are multiple attributes that go into it. In some ways, I cannot cover this, uh, all aspects of this uh, in the next few minutes I have. Um, but there are three things that we have seen that company where we have either observed or we have helped companies implement. Um, and I'm going to touch upon those three things uh, and then have some closing thoughts around the same. The first component is uh, um, having a dynamic job architecture. What I mean by that is um, because of the legacy HRIS systems that many companies have, the job architecture has become a very, very complex exercise where it doesn't, it is not very dynamic. It is not observing a set of peers in terms of what new jobs are coming in, what are the opportunities that can be opened up to our existing workforce. And this is not just in technology. Normally, the examples that would come in when you talk about job architecture are, hey, you know, you have these awesome new roles coming into technology. We have an IoT engineer, you have uh, an embedded security engineer and so on, or you have like a compliance engineer in cybersecurity. Well, those are all true. Non-technical uh, components are also dramatically digitally transforming. And I, uh, to an extent where we cannot even call them as uh, non-technical, right? Let us look at communication rules, for example. You have at least three different categories of jobs that have entered this uh, taxonomy, whether it is crisis communication, which was extremely useful during the pandemic times, whether it is community engagement, whether it is a digital community or a local community or a country specific community and so on. And also the managing multiple streams of communication through platforms like uh, Podium, for example, right? And a lot of these roles are your middle layer can easily be trained into these digital tech stack 
and you can dramatically have uh, some of the project managers or program managers could be transitioned into these roles and these are all roles that are uh, extremely extremely critical across internal communication external communication product and technical communication and having a knowledge, the the challenge that we have seen is many companies uh, uh, existing taxonomy is not changing enough to reflect such opportunities and the other pari also spoke yesterday about the greening effect of the uh, economy and sustainability is pretty much entering every single function and there are multiple roles whether it is sustainability from a procurement perspective sustainability from a communication standpoint or from a product development standpoint what are the aspects that you need to measure monitor and report and there are compliance components that are evolving across europe and us and uh, uh, you know asia so these roles have very simpler reskilling paths like 3 to 4 month type of a reskilling path and that can tremendously benefit your hollowing middle now this is one component so having a dynamic job architecture is uh, absolutely uh, essential in getting ready towards the future of work and we have uh, worked with multiple fortune 1000 companies in uh, where we have seen that this has a direct tangible outcome the second component is in general how do we boost the organization self belief right and and once again these are there are multiple attributes associated with this but in um, i was quite drawn by the dissertation that was published by stanford researcher daniel green on um, self acquirability belief um, how important that is many of the folks in the hollowing middle truly believe that uh, truly uh, are not at a state where they believe they can learn some of the new skills and this is one of the problems that is uh, actually impacting large enterprises and medium sized enterprises because when you talk about all these new technologies and all the digital transformation uh, even the people who are closer to it hearing it do not believe that they can actually pick up one of that and uh, uh, drive it and that is a very important component that we need to work hard and the skill acquirability acquirability belief and the job availability belief in combination drives maximum learning outcome so this is a fantastic dissertation I encourage you to check it out uh, if possible uh, but the point that i was trying to make is every learning pillar whether it is ai cyber security iot and so on needs to be defined from a learning map standpoint that means let's say you take ai there are some skill clusters that are common across roles but then there are some unique clusters that gets factored in if you want to be a deep learning expert versus a computer vision engineering uh person or you want to be uh, a little bit on the device software integrated level these are very different paths and uh and that has to be defined and even uh some of the engineers have told us that these maps are extremely useful for them even though they are technologists seeing this and understanding uh, a mapping at a course level right today the other thing that has happened is we have phenomenal digital assets whether it is in the form of uh courses uh, and you can actually classify these courses from a low cost no cost and uh, a provided option such as uh, a typical uh course provider option like a linkedin learning or a coursera you the where mapping like this also encourages your people who would normally not check it out they can possibly your enterprise uh, resources can check out the low cost options or the no cost options at least get in and then see whether they need to sustain in that area so this learning map and self belief is uh, a, a very very important component and uh, that can accelerate uh, to your future readiness and third i know this is easier said than done having an inclusive strategy we spoke quite a bit about this even yesterday how the importance of diversity is important in boards leadership level at all employee levels and uh, today there is no argument that uh, inclusiveness is absolutely the way to go when it comes to conquering the future and um, there is a, there is definitely a supply problem in the sense uh, 
a drop when we analyze the SDE talent, the software engineer talent for black ethnicity in the US. There is about 11,000 people, uh, give or take, and uh, an equal number of people, another 11,000 people for, who are in the adjacent um, uh, skills near software development, perhaps on the IT testing side or on the IT services side. Now, we are not seeing enough pl defined plans to really bring these adjacent folks into software development. Um, while people are fighting really, really hard to get people who are already in, enterprises have to change gear and establish academies to train, uh, you know, borrowing the uh, assembly line concepts from Ford. Can we bring adjacent people at an accelerated rate and put them through uh, an academy within the enterprise and uh, thereby they become SDEs in say six months or nine months time frame, And this has to be taken very, very seriously if we have to have a meaningful future readiness. Um, in conclusion, um, it is not just enough if we tactically plan, think about the future, track some um, you know, evolving skills and say that we are future ready. We truly have to make the future inclusive across all aspects. And we have to do a number of uh, uh, strategic action items with that. But if we can do that, if we can impart self-belief in the organization, if we can make sure that this is an inclusive journey, if we can make sure that our employees have in, in one year, two years from now, have case studies where an analyst just said, you know, I was not connected to technology, now I'm a software developer or, or even a QA automation tester or a data scientist. If you can gather such case studies, then we will be on to this journey in a very, very powerful way. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, truly appreciate your time. Thank Over you, you very much, Vijay. Yes, and I wanted to thank the audience for your questions. Really appreciate your participation. We have time for one since we're running a little over and the rest we'll take offline. So we'll make sure you get your questions answered. Sushmita is asking, will the future workforce consist of contract or freelance experts contrary to permanent roles that companies currently offer? No, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, great question. Uh, we address that from a contingent labor um, standpoint. I think different geographies have, sh have shown different levels of maturity. Uh, contingency work uh, is getting very popular in Europe and beginning to show some um, faith in, uh, uh, in the US. Um, I, I think um, it's going to be a combination of how we define the taxonomy. Certain jobs that would require hyper-specialization can actually be part of contingent labor force. And also certain jobs, uh, whether it is uh, within marketing or an IT, where uh, it is sort of sophisticated job, but a little bit routine jobs, those also could go, to, go into a uh, contingent labor pool. And also certain jobs which require on-site presence uh, could also, where you can't really outsource it, say 10,000 miles away, uh, coast to coast. Those also, uh, there also the contingent labor would dominate. Uh, I think the pandemic to a certain, we have some evidence that the pandemic has slowed down contingent uh, labor uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, we are still building some models around that. We'll be able to quantify that a uh, lot more granularly in the next uh, two to three months. Uh, but it is for here to stay and uh, it, will, uh, it will definitely be a boardroom strategy in the next year, few years to come. Yeah, thank, thank you, Vijay. That was a great question. And we'll, again, we'll take the other ones offline. Okay, so next up, we have a coffee chat on empowering the global workforce to innovate and scale. Stay right there. For us, over the years, our mantra has become very, very um, ingrained in what we do, and it's three words. One team, 
one effort, one win. How are we one unified force? When we talk about one team, what makes one team? And we'll obviously think about, okay, the vibrance probably make one team, but it's three parts to it. It's us as leadership, it's our team who are the vibrance, and it's our customers and our clients who are our partners. Collectively, we make one. Well, with more clarity on the new way of working, some changes and decisions will stick and some business and organizational priorities will have to be rewritten for good. This next coffee chat will explore how global teams can be led through uncertainties like COVID and where and how to invest in the workforce life cycle for the greatest returns on a hybrid workforce to address some of these issues we have with us. Ajay Kumar, Head of Engineering Services Americas at Tech Mahindra. He's a strict believer in leveraging the power of an engineering mindset to deliver exceptional experiences around products and platforms. Next up is Rohan Chandran, Chief Product Officer at Data Axel, where he oversees products, technology, and data with a focus on creating valuable solutions for their clients and partners. And to moderate the discussion, we have Sidhant Rastogi, Managing Partner and Global Head at Zinov, where he heads the marketing expansion for service providers practice. Sidhant, over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, what an excellent keynote we've had from Vijay. And to follow up, I could not have asked for better speakers in, uh, in my panel here today, uh, in the coffee chat we are going to have. Uh, we have two very senior leaders uh, from the US and from Bay Area. Uh, and between them, they have over half a century worth of experience. Uh, what is the most interesting is each of them joined their current CXO positions bang in the middle of the pandemic, right? And that meant that they had a unique set of challenges. Uh, they had no time to soak in and absorb. Uh, what a great uh, opportunity to learn uh, about these challenges and how they mitigated each of them uh, from uh, these eminent panelists. Uh, Rohan, I will come to you uh, to start with. Uh, you have been a Bay Area veteran starting from Stanford and continuing your tech journey across startups and large enterprises. Uh, what was it to join Data Axel as Chief Product Officer just a few months back? And also, um, what did the actual term of uh, the chat we have in terms of leading global technology teams through pandemic times actually mean to you? What were your top challenges and how did you really mitigate them? Yeah, thank, thanks, Siddhant. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, right? It's been quite the experience. I don't think there's one thing I predicted correctly about what my first 12 months at Data Axel would be like. I joined at the end of February last year and then the world shut down. I hope your um, boss is not around. <laughs> it was interesting for us because we were a fairly distributed company in the US, but we were, as I joined, one of the charters for me was to open up our global operation and we were figuring out where to locate it. And this was all thought of pre-pandemic. Um, in reality, I think the pandemic situation accelerated us. And you know, I've been doing this, as you said, for 20 years. And if you go back in time, I've built a team in India, built teams across multiple countries, and now using India again. The reasons have been the same every time we've done that, right? Everyone's doing it to help with a combination of access to talent, transformation and acceleration, and of course, cost efficiency. But the process, and as you pointed out, it's been learned on the fly here. It's, it's been really different. And it's not something that there was a textbook for. And we haven't had to do this. The last pandemic in 1918, there was no globalization of this nature. I think for us um, and, and for me personally, one of the biggest keys in these situations is finding leaders. And you know, if you're opening a single location, it's finding the leader. That person is always the most critical part of that process. And all of a sudden in these circumstances, you're doing that through virtual meetings from halfway across the world in different time zones, 
and you're placing a really critical bet for the company. So we've had to actually rethink completely in that process, the process of interviewing and, and how do you pass judgment on this person who's going to take responsibility for hundreds of people and buckets of revenue? I, I don't think I've ever in my career until now hired someone at an executive level without sitting down for lunch or dinner a couple of times, right? And you're, you're reading body language, you're getting a feel for how they react to situations on the fly. You're assessing character outside of the formal process. And, you know, one thing I've learned is I've had to really trust my instinct a lot, right? You can ask all the questions and go deep. And, and fortunately, I've been doing this for 20 years. It's a real challenge if you haven't done this seven, several times before to say, okay, this is how I'm going to make that assessment. Yep, this, this just feels right. And, you know, we, we feel comfortable we hit the ball out of the park on that one. The other challenge then after putting the leader in place has been, you know, as you're building out a team, you're trying to create gestalt in the team, right? Every individual is, is a part and, and your goal as a leader is always to make the whole more than the sum of the parts. But they're all separate from each other. And in our case, they're scattered all over India in their hometowns and not even in Pune where they're building up. And so you've got to build this sense of togetherness and collaboration with a group of people who have never met one another, may not for another six or nine months yet. And you've got to keep them excited about joining a company when there's no tangible company feel that comes with the bustling office that you go into interview and you see that all happening around you. So we've had to put a lot of work into how do we engage people? How do we foster those connections and very actively on a daily basis, keep people feeling that they're part of something bigger. So that, that continuous interaction and making sure that all those conversations are not just functional. Hey, you have a task, you have a JIRA ticket to follow, but you're part of this, family and we're trying to instill company values and principles right and create an ethos and culture that fits with your global entity and you're doing that in a normal circumstance but again now everyone's operating blind so I can't overemphasize fortunately or unfortunately how much of this is as simple as but as difficult as heavy investment of time and energy right this this is a recurring theme as I was thinking about what really makes the difference here. It's no coincidence that we're seeing a whole lot of pandemic burnout, but you know, you need your, your managers, your people to make that effort to make those one-to-one -one connections. And it's, you know, outside of normal working hours and 7 PM for someone or 7 AM for someone else, but that engagement and where we've done that well, we're seeing the success and where we have even just, you know, fallen off a couple of percent, we've seen the struggle. And so it's, it's, it's pretty firm to my mind that that's essential to create the payoff that you're looking for. Awesome. I think the one other challenge we've seen in this time is that everybody wants to go global now, right? As, as a <laughs> consequence of the pandemic almost. And people have realized that geography is fairly arbitrary. And so the, the sort of competition you're facing for talent and creating that engagement really sort of makes you double down on that, that need. Interesting, interesting. So uh, three key things, right? So one is uh, the leaders in terms of hiring them, talent, uh, building the ethos uh, in the talent that you hire. And of course, um, you know, going global, which increases the competition for talent. I think we'll come back to uh, maybe one or more of these topics. Uh, but I want to quickly get Ajay in on this, right? So Ajay, um, uh, you know, you have been part of a large tech companies, you know, not just leading few hundreds uh, of or thousands of people, but tens of thousands of folks uh, spread across globally. And you've been doing this for over two decades. Uh, you came into Tech Mahindra. Uh, what was it that was very different? Something that, uh, you know, you, you didn't expect. What was the challenge that you faced? And how did you look at solving that? Thanks, Adant. Uh, I joined three to four months back at Tech Mahindra. And uh, on a lighter note, no honeymoon period at all. It was all action <laughs> from day one. Uh, to get on to the point, let me take a real life example. We all drive cars, right? And when you're driving a car, you're going on a straight road. And when, whenever there is a turn which is going to come across or a bend, reflexly, your foot is going to get off the gas pedal and you're going to go onto the brakes, slow down, make a smooth turn. Now, if, if you compare that with the racing car environment, every bend, every curve for the driver is an opportunity because that's an opportunity for the driver to take over its competitor. Now, if you take this pandemic as a bend and a very crude analogy, uh, what I believe personally is that 
individuals as well as the organization have reacted very very differently to it because each one of us unique we have different uh, uh, appetite hunger different kind of risk taking abilities different kind of goals for ourselves so one of the biggest challenge which was there that in these kind of surreal times how do you help your customers navigate and be able to service their end clients better and if you couple with that uh, a concept of saying that all across our associates how do we build a mindset of a growth mindset which is on a board footing so i was talking to a cxo of a fortune company and he made two very interesting observations he said that uh, covid believe it or not has been the biggest chief digital officer <laughs> and the second comment he made was uh, he said uh, i sometimes ponder and what has stopped us for taking all these big bold digital initiative which we are taking right now why not a year back and that same mindset when you talk about a growth mindset on a board footing for our us as a team together it's all about looking at the value zones which you create for our customers one simple way to look at a value zone is that i am a service provider mr customer how do i fare better with my competitors my peers in the industry that's one way to look at value another way to look at the value is saying that mr customer we have already contracted for certain things how do i deliver something over and above whatever is contracted in my sow or po with you and that's value definition there could be another way to look at value and that value could be am i truly helping my customer serve their end clients better am i really helping them to be more competitive than their peers in the market and also in in some case if you push them a little further uh, if there is a b2b environment am i helping my customer to help their clients to become more competitive in their market space so it's a long long word and answer to your question but uh, challenge has been all across helping customers uh wait through these times and get a growth mindset on a war footing for our associates interesting uh very interesting ajay that you spoke about the bend and uh the racing car mentality i was just lo- seeing the some of the channels with where they drift in uh to the uh, to the curve which is a very different kind of mindset as well and i'll just pick on that right and and we now know and you rightly said that uh, everyone believes that now is the time to invest and grow for the future and uh, yesterday paris uh, keynote as well spoke about uh, the impending growth war so this year is going to be the year of the growth war you spoke about all the right things in terms of overtaking competition uh, and this growth war is going to be fought on multiple battlefronts right it's the battlefront of technology battlefront of talent uh what are those one or two key decisions that you are uh, in the process of making or have made uh to ensure that you win this war great question actually uh there is a quotation which is comes to my mind which is very close to my heart it says yesterday is history tomorrow is a mystery today is a gift and that's why we call it the present so the pitch approach which we have taken to this market conditions as a team together tech mahindra is that we want to help our customers what they want to be tomorrow do it today and now so the tagline is engineer your next dot now and it stands on three pillars accelerate better time to market invent do something really really differentiated in the market space and transform if you're doing business in a particular way can we help you do a business completely transformed in another way mm-hmm. and to do that like you rightly saying it's all about investments in people process technology be it hiring leadership upskilling cross skilling right from our ceo in the organization we are all top down saying that hey we're going to ensure that we're going to get trained improve our value which we generate on all our interface with clients and we have been investing to big time in technology with our kind of a big leverage which we have in the uh, telecom industry how do this 5g is going to play a big role for the enterprises can we bring all the best things which can be done to the enterprises leveraging the 5g world and investments we are not been shy of saying that we want to go out in the market and acquire companies you might have followed us in the last 3 4 months itself we announced uh, four acquisitions and which were very very pointed to get very very niche talent in niche geographies which can actually be exploded on a global level for a big big uh, kind of a uh, scale perfect uh, perfect ajay great so uh, rohar i'll come back to you um, and we discussed this right i would not let this go Uh, so you have been this uh, you know looked at this talent journey from a very long time right from your stanford days where you actually co-founded crick info uh, that's almost the only uh, digital firm and media digital media firm that i know uh, that has survived over 20 years right and uh, you have 
we have gone through multiple companies including yahoo etc yahoo went past some of the other companies have thrived uh in your mind as a uh, technology leader in the post pandemic world what are the renewed priority of a tech leader especially when managing multi location talent team yeah that's a great question look i think it's it is a new era and accelerated of course by covid you know you said multi location teams at the end there i think we're going to reach a point at which we're not even thinking of that word location yeah. right we're just leaders building teams and actually it's, it's kind of embarrassing for me to admit right now but i have plenty of people in my org today whose locations are a complete mystery to me i don't know where they are and what i've realized is i don't need to know where they are it it really doesn't matter i just need to know when people are available so there's a whole mindset shift that we're going to need in this sort of new new leader for this new age who can embrace that right and you're going to see that comes out of that you're going to see a massive embracing of meritocracy and remote or hybrid work ultimately just forces you in that direction right there's there's an absence of other context so people will be judged on their results which is how it should be but i think the risk of this which leaders have to manage is you know you don't want your teams to feel in any way less than human right we're all people we want to be seen as such even if we're measured on results and output so you know i look at it as the, the biggest thing we need as leaders going forward and in our technology leaders is that ability to have and really drive with empathy and use it constructively right i i you know give an example just us based only right working out of silicon valley as you said for 20 years with people who worked here for better or for worse there's a somewhat homogenized working culture right you expect people to react certain ways in certain situations because that's what their professional experience has guided them to do and so you know you you go into a conference room for a meeting in silicon valley and i expect at you know 4 pm when my time is up the next person is going to open the door walk in and let me know hey you're out buster um it's my turn to use the room as i learned very quickly in the midwest people will wait outside and i'll come out 15 minutes late and then they'll be apologizing to me for having waited for me outside and and this difference in cultures and mindsets and understanding you need a leader now because all those people are not together in one place they don't have that opportunity they have to be able to really dive in and understand and create that gestalt across the organization i think the other thing that we've learned um actively and really transformed our process and i referenced interviewing for the leader earlier but as we're interviewing for talent engineering talent in particular right our a whole operating model has changed right so as we're spread out over time zones the extent to which we need to incorporate asynchronous communication in what we're doing is significant right we don't necessarily want everyone working at the same time we want everyone to be comfortable in whatever time zone they are so we need to make sure that that written communication skill is really strong right whether it's a jira ticket a chat message and email and this is much more dramatic than it sounds because it means you have to rethink your hiring profile and process right so we're all used to engineers studying on lead code doing 100 questions there and finally you know cracking that interview and that's how we judge and hire them some of our engineering teams are now pointedly including a communication and writing assessment as part of an engineering interview it's non standard we sometimes have candidates look askance but it has made a difference because that's the nature of the way we have to operate now and we're now validating up front can this person actually fit into this environment and not be misunderstood and not misunderstand as we're we're talking asynchronously all the time so it's a, it's a real it. shift and a difference nice that's a very interesting perspective rohan thank you uh, ajay i'll uh, just come to the last of the the questions and before i get into the q and a Uh, we've got one or two very interesting questions uh what i want to ask is uh, you know we spoke about you know how it's going to be a talent uh, supply constraint market we've got a full day dedicated only to discuss that uh, how do you see uh, you know the difference in how you believe large enterprises should be leveraging tech services firms or how you are yourself investing in uh, you know building capability in diverse locations to help uh, that particular cause sure uh what in my opinion i believe uh, one of the key elements is all about a very open and transparent communication which is built on trust along with customers the once you understand the problem the stated and the unstated needs 
the solution may not lie with either party, but jointly we can figure out a solution. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a customer, a large fortune customer, industrial manufacturing. Because of geopolitical as well as because of the pandemic, they decided that they had to move uh, $1.5 billion worth of their sourcing, which was in China, to different parts of the world. Mexico, uh, Asian countries, India included. And the solution, how are we going to implement that for them and build a resilient supply chain? So it's all about how do you openly communicate, figure out the unstated needs as well, and figure out a solution. To your question around uh, uh, le leveraging the diverse locations, uh, there was a very interesting experiment which was done some time back. And the experiment was that, uh, and I was reading about it, so you have a glass transparent bottle, and you play, place it horizontally on a table, and you put a half a dozen flies inside the bottle, and you also put the same number of bees into the bottle. And you should keep the bottom of the bottle facing towards the window where the sunlight is coming and let the, let the bees and the flies try to figure out as to how they're going to escape from the bottle. And the interesting angle which was there was that while the flies took less than a couple of minutes to figure out a way to go zigzag moment here and there, the bees with their tendency of having very logical processing, they were only trying to go towards the sunlight. And after half an hour, they were all exhausted on, onto the floor of the bottle. And that article linked this entire experiment with how organizations have bees and flies in them, where they will have the bees with the brightest talents on the fast track growth, but they'll be all about logic, database decisions which are there. How the flies will come across with their school of experience and they'll do a lot of decision on intuition. And the reason I believe that is relevant to the question you asked is for all of us to figure out the strength of your teams as to which person has got what strength and what, what situation that person is going to excel in. Once you do that mapping and you bring in all the leverage of your global footprint, uh, things start coming out uh, pretty, pretty nicely in terms of serving your customers, help their clients better. And that, that's very interesting, Ajay. So uh, what I'll do is maybe I'll have time for just one final question from the audience and I'll maybe take, this, uh, take the lead from where you mentioned and use uh, a, a relevant question there. Um, and Rohan, you also spoke about, uh, you know, hiring the right leader and how it's getting difficult. Uh, one of the questions we have is, um, how is it different? I mean, so are there different skill sets and capabilities that you need to look for? Uh, like, we all know we have a mental map, we have uh, typical roles defined, our HR is trained to hire certain type of folks uh, in leadership positions. Is it different now? And how is it different? Can you just give a practitioner's perspective? Rohan, maybe you can go first and then Ajay. Sure. I mean, there's uh, it is different in my mind. And I think as we look forward, it's even more different. There's a bunch of things. I think one I'd probably highlight is you have to, you have to, I think, now look for someone with a, I'll call it a low operating ego. I'm actually a fan of people having egos. They should have that self-belief and confidence. But the, you know, the command and control model of leadership, which is often exercised, especially as you go global, that is rapidly become very anachronistic in this new era, right? And, and there's a quote I've always loved um, and used that a leader is measured not by how many followers they have, but by how many leaders they create. And in this model going forward, which is highly decentralized now, again, because of what we've just gone, gone through, that acceleration is happening, your leaders of the future cannot command and control as if they're in a centralized military operation with everyone standing around them. They have to accept that this is decentralized and they have to be very comfortable and confident in allowing and delegating and building up leaders at every corner of the organization, right? You can't have the traditional every issue or question bubbles up one side of the hierarchy across to the next leader and then down the other side of the hierarchy to get uh, resolved you need people at all levels to exercise that leadership, which means your leader at the top of the traditional org chart needs to be very comfortable in their skin of saying, you know, right. not about me. It's not about me making decisions. It's about me pushing that out to others. And, you know, that's, that is the way, way forward at this point. Awesome. So Ajay, you want to build on your, um, how do you find the flies from the bees? If that's what you're going to look at. <laughs> uh, I, I think for me, it's uh, one thing which stands out, especially during these times, is empathy-based leadership. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because uh, it helps us as individuals while we're interacting with our customers to step in their shoes and look at the world from their point of view 
and figure out, like I was articulating earlier, how do you figure out the stated needs obviously come out, but how do you figure out the unstated needs? Once you figure out the unstated needs, the value which you are able to generate could be extremely disruptive. So that's one thing on empathy-based leadership that actually stands out for me. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Rohan and Ajay. Uh, this has been a great panel. I know this was short, but hope, uh, hopefully the audience has enjoyed it. Uh, back to you, uh, Amy, to continue this interesting uh, confluence. Just want to make one comment. The next time when we get together, Rohan, I'll uh, definitely strive to get a similar kind of a digital background as you, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Siddhan. Okay, thank you all. All right, guys. Take care. All the very best. Thank you. Yeah, what a great, great conversation full of heart and empathy. When we're talking about people, that's how it should be. Thank you so much. Well, everyone stay tuned for the next keynote talk by Jason Conyard, CIO at VMware. Thank you, Ron. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity, we can make it work for you and your business. session, industry veteran Jason Conyard, CIO at VMware, will share his insights on how to combine different workplaces. We've got in-office virtual and hybrid, and how to keep them working as effectively and high performing as possible. Jason leads VMware's global information and technology organization, a group that manages critical technology systems supporting the company's worldwide business operations. Jason, over to you. <coughs> Hello, and thank you for the chance to speak to you on this important topic. I'm Jason Conyard. I'm the CIO of VMware, a leading innovator in enterprise software. We're a $12 billion company with 34,000 employees around the world. We started as a virtualization company, which is about improving hardware utilization by utilizing virtual servers. That's similar to our hybrid topic today, of workspaces. It's all about making the most of your resources by abstracting the physical location. I've been involved in the design and implementation of our hybrid work approach, so I'm thrilled to share what I know about supporting high-performing teams. It was a year ago that much of the world went into our COVID lockdown. I remember the moment I realized the scale of the situation. Our talent pool went from 20% working remotely to 95% within a few days last March. Now, a year later, we have a better perspective. For the most part, we've learned to cope as companies and as a society, but there have been a lot of trade-offs. We miss human interaction and we're balancing the needs of our families. Also, Working remotely is largely a knowledge worker privilege, not open to everyone. Recent estimates show that remote work is available to less than 5% of the workers in service industries worldwide. Many companies in retail, healthcare, and hospitality have been resourceful in adapting. But this is a complex issue that has impacted many of the world's most vulnerable workers. As thought leaders, we have a responsibility to seek and to push for solutions that are equitable and for the long term. One thing's for sure, as we come out of the pandemic, 
many companies will be moving to a hybrid model. Hybrid means some workers have an assigned office space. Some work remotely and others will be in the office a few days a week. Optimizing for this model means helping people to be productive, collaborative and engaged wherever they are. But this isn't gonna happen by chance. It requires planning and your plan should reflect your values. With VMware, our philosophy has prioritized employee success over location. For employees, this meant their work location was not determined by their manager, but it was up to the employee. Over the next few minutes, I'm gonna cover four areas of hybrid work scenarios. You'll see that employee choice is a big part of all of them. Productivity has been a top concern in the shift to remote work. As my company, we went from 95% of our employees to re, you know, remote, which was a huge challenge. And we assumed that there would be a drop in productivity. So we decided we'd do an internal survey to check. It turns out 58% of employees said they were more productive. This can, this, that's consistent with the majority of studies we've looked at too. So why the boost? Well, the good news is for many of us, there's no commute. And right now there's no business travel and there are fewer office distractions. And yes, there's also the possibility that people have been concerned about job security. But there are active steps that we can take and there are absolutely things that my IT team has taken the lead on. One is home office gear. We have a program to equip our employees with the right equipment and resources to be productive at home. Our colleagues used to love our on-site tech bar. With people working remotely, we had to shift completely to an online model. And that has also meant rethinking things like language support on our service desk. We have also thought about new behaviors and changing settings on our calendaring system to allow people five minute breaks between meetings. And you'll love this one, and maybe some of you have done this too. Some teams have chosen to have no Zoom meeting days. And, and even and better than that, some teams have even questioned the need to have a meeting at all to get some things done. Okay, so you know that productivity is more than a laptop and a VPN. So what about that connection? In an office, you expect high speed, reliable networks, but at home, your connection might be shared with others. It may be unreliable or you may have lower bandwidth. At VMware, our IT team has been proactive. If we see a colleague with a poor home connection, we work with them to make it better so it is more reliable and higher performing. Okay, so we all know that we can be productive working alone. But collaboration is a group event. We expect to engage each other in conference rooms and around whiteboards. So I, I did some informal research. I uh, Googled collaboration at work to see what images came back. <clears throat> I can tell you this, number one, high fives are very popular, at least in all of the photo shoots. And two, nearly all of the images showed people working together in space and time. Of the 30 photos, only one showed collaboration via a virtual method. Think about that. If collaboration cannot happen virtually, every organization would suffer, and it will be especially hard for companies that depend on creativity and innovation. As a software innovator, we had to find ways for our people to get together to make that magic happen. Again, this was an area that our IT team took an active role. This is an internal promo for our virtual reality program. Any team can request loaner gear to meet in virtual space. These can be used for immersive training, campus tours, new hire training, and more. We also have whiteboarding apps for brainst real-time brainstorming and also asynchronous communication. <clears throat> but I'll just say, be sure as you think about these tools, make sure they integrate with your other collaboration apps and that they're accessible to people with disabilities. The last thing on this, 
tools are only as good as their adoption. I've been proud to see our IT team look beyond tools and get passionate about sharing best practices and guides. They understand that success is about adoption and that requires thoughtful change management. Last July, we sponsored a third party survey of 5,700 global decision makers on the subject of distributed work. 62% of the respondents said that collaboration was equal to or better than before. Now, that's not everybody, but it shows that we can collaborate virtually. It's just that the Google images need to catch up. Now let's talk about recruiting and retention. This is where we find one of the most promising effects of the hybrid work practices. Organizations have traditionally placed offices in major cities and location was, deci location was deciding the hiring and indeed where people would live. Look at the difference. When home offices are business offices, every employee location is a workplace. The distribution is broader, less centralized, and a wider pool of talent means more great candidates and helps with our diversity goals. It's good for retention too. When employees can live where they want, their quality of life and job satisfaction increases. That boosts loyalty and retention, which drives down turnover and increases efficiency and morale. It's a virtuous circle that kicks in, all based on employee choice. Hybrid work um, supports our equity goals too. So equity is about providing a level playing field for everyone. For example, in-person settings tend to favor those who are physically and verbally predominant. Remote work is changing that. In our July survey, 65% of respondents felt more empowered to speak up in virtual meetings than in person. And 69% said team members were more likely to be candid with leaders. There's another finding from our original research. Pre-pandemic, less than one third of respondents considered the remote work option a requirement. Looking ahead, many more respondents are considering remote, remote work a non-negotiable. That's a fast change from perk to prerequisite, and it's most pronounced in North America. Here we come to culture. Our chief people officer, Betsy Sutter, has a saying, people join communities, not companies. I love that saying because it reminds us of how connected we are with our colleagues. But what does that mean in a time of less togetherness? We had to rethink our cultural building blocks and find new rituals and behaviors that will keep us connected. For example, we've been using chat and polling features in Zoom uh, much more to encourage spontaneous interactions. Our company meetings were moved from our Palo Alto gym to online, and that's more accessible, there's higher attendance, and you know what? They're less expensive. And then there's our annual user conference, VMworld. It's now online too, and our audience is bigger, and it also affords the opportunity for our employees to attend. Technology has a role to play as well. We knew that people were feeling disconnected because so many interactions are virtual. As humans, we miss real faces. As a result, our internal photo management system was born. It's an online tool that lets people share photos across our corporate applications. You can choose a formal photo from the company directory or change to a casual shot for Teams and Slack that's much more conversational. It's even generated, it'll even generate an avatar for you if you'd like. And again, this is all based around employee choice. One of the best outcomes is seeing people's faces across our enterprise apps. Seeing a coworker's smile in the procurement system, well, you know, that's a delightful surprise. This doesn't necessarily sell more product, but right now it's important and a welcome, uh, a welcome capability that really is important when we're craving more human interaction. I'm an IT guy, 
And up to this point, I haven't got too techy, and I actually, I promise you, I won't. But as we pivot to hybrid work scenarios, a shift is occurring. Home internet service is now business service with security and performance issues to consider. But home is also where we live, so we need to balance privacy protections too. Looking at security, there's no more remote access. It's just access. So as we shift to remote, we really need to move away from the idea of headquarter and branch office connectivity to newer zero trust or software defined perimeter models. With privacy, we need to be mindful of how we deal with personal data now that our home office equipment includes cameras and microphones. This is a new area for many of us who manage corporate networks and systems, and it will require our constant vigilance to enable and protect our employees. To sum up, it's clear that the hybrid work model is here to stay. Fortune magazine just completed this US poll. The hybrid model is the top employee choice. As IT and business leaders, our job is to enable our colleagues to do their best work while delivering a great experience. Before I wrap up, let me give a shout out to IT professionals who have been so crucial during this time. You have often been unnoticed, but you have been essential and will be for our future hybrid working models. Now, I imagine many in the audience are attending and are devising their own hybrid work plans. So here are some takeaways. Number one, it's all about people. Talk to them, listen to them, and offer them choice. Two, the home office, even if it's the corner of a kitchen table, is a business office. It needs high levels of reliability, connectivity, and security while balancing privacy. Three, build a robust planning team with members from diverse disciplines. Their perspective will make your plan stronger and make sure you include your IT team as well. Fourth and finally, let's all recognize this moment for what it is. It's a profound opportunity for us to move things forward in support of our fellow employees, customers, and society in general. I've enjoyed talking to you today and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Excellent, Jason, loved your insights. And we do have two questions, so you ready? <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, good. Abigail is saying, I'm interested in your emphasis on people. Is this a personal philosophy you've always had or is it something a bit more recent? Uh, it's a, it, it's a, certainly a personal philosophy for me and, uh, and it certainly uh, had a marked impact on how I've navigated my career. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the great thing as well is that I work at VMware where that's equally a priority for us. So it's kind of a match made in heaven. That makes sense. Great. And Seth is asking, can you talk a little bit more about how you were able to pivot so quickly to remote work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and probably a, a talk all in and of itself. But the, the short version is um, a lot of the, the things that we needed um, to, to have to be able to make that pivot so dramatically were already in place. And a lot of them uh, candidly are VMware products. And they just they made it possible for our employees to have what they need on their systems already. And uh, while people may have needed an extra monitor or a microphone or a camera, um, in terms of you know uh, in terms of productivity, all of their tools are ready to go. Everything from virtual desktops and servers uh, all the way through to the security and the network performance uh, tools that we have. Excellent. Thanks again, Jason. Thank you. All right, stay put because next we have a keynote, Inclusion in the New Normal. We'll be right back. Speed is the new currency of business. In the new digital economy, 
Effective competition requires a balanced approach to deep digital transformation that drives direct business value. By combining frictionless technology delivery with deep industry expertise, Virtusa helps business move forward faster. We help our clients advance to their optimal business state and achieve quick and continuous return on their investments. Virtusa is an end-to-end -end provider delivering the full spectrum of technology services for our clients. Now on to a very important topic, equity and inclusion in the workplace, focusing on best prax practices to ensure a fair workplace for all employees and understanding how data can help discover trends and patterns. Technology in the new normal can really enhance strategic collaboration to build a diverse, inclusive company culture. So please join me in welcoming Mary Fairchild, Global Director of Diversity and Inclusion at F5. Mary works as the Global Director of Diversity and Inclusion where she tests and innovates new concepts to people problems that have exi existed in organizations for far too long. Over to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Amy. Great to be here. I, um, I am going to just jump right into the great content we have. Um, a lot of it, I'm hearing themes come up right now of, of the new normal and what that will be like. So um, we'll start here by just telling you a little bit about F5 and how we think about diversity and inclusion. We try to take a holistic approach. And so we've been using this framework that you may have heard about called IDEA, and that's an acronym. It stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Allyship. And what I wanna go through today with you all is talking about those concepts, what they are, and then what I see has changed in each of those and kind of a, a future cast, if you will, and see if it, if it sparks any innovation for you. So for inclusion, and again, these are really um, hard to define concepts. They're very um, dense, but I'm gonna try to be a little bit reductive, but try to encapsulate them today because I think it's super important that when we talk about these concepts, we do apply them to our own company culture and say, what does that mean to us? So this is what F5's definition of inclusion is. We think about belonging for sure, but we also think about does an individual feel they have growth do they feel their performance is being looked at objectively? And do they feel like their voice is being heard? And you'll notice feel was in all of those because inclusion is really about how does that individual feel working at our organization at F5. Diversity, not much change in here, just that it's focused on the demographics, right? Dem and those demographics are starting to evolve. We're looking at various aspects that we never looked at before in the past, but Pretty typical representation, hiring, retention, and growth. That's how we define it here. And then equity. And equity is a, a term that is fairly new in the diversity and inclusion space um, for corporate America. And it's important that everyone understand what we mean by equity. So at F5, we've taken the time to really define it and tie it to our diversity and inclusion mission. And our mission is to make sure that everyone feels they can be themselves and reach their full potential. And for us, that means that equity um, is giving the resources, opportunity, and information that is needed for that individual, which may be bespoke in order for them to be able to reach their full potential. And then the last is A, allyship. And for us, those are the behaviors that an individual can have to support the other aspects of inclusion, diversity, and equity. So allyship is uh, your own personal individual behaviors, listening and learning, um, taking courageous action, and of course, checking on the impact of your, your own actions. And one of the things I like to bring to life here to really say these new, newer ideas of equity and allyship, how they can work together. Allyship, is, if equity is making sure individuals get access to what they need, allyship is taking the resources um, that you need not that are available to you. So that means just because you can have it, if you don't need it, 
maybe don't take it because somebody else could use it. So making sure that you are doing what you can to um, reinforce inclusion, diversity, and equity. Okay, so those are the concepts. Super important that we make sure in the new world, we have very strong definitions of what we're talking about here. So there's no room for, um, for people to misunderstand what the objective is of each of these. So like you've heard in many of the other um, discussions today, COVID, um, also the racial reckoning and the waves of that that are happening around the world have really brought us into new challenges and new opportunities, new normals or the next normal, whatever that may look like. And I'm just gonna spend some time sharing some thoughts of my own um, that I hope resonate for you all of what that could look like when it comes to idea. So we'll start with inclusion. When I think about inclusion in the future, we, we've heard about collaboration tools and how important those will be and the adoption of those tools. When I think about that, I think of the intentionality that needs to come with inclusion. So it won't be enough to um, hope for the inclusion or to start to target inclusion at groups, but it has to be very intentional moment to moment. Um, we heard in the last discussion about having a hybrid world where there'll be individuals who are in an office and individuals on a phone call and how those experiences are so different. Um, and how will we level the playing field and make sure everyone feels included in those situations? That's the new normal. And that means we may come up with new um, norms for our own behavior. Like perhaps even if you're in a conference room, you don't use a, a, a speaker phone from within the room, but you all jump onto your computers so that everybody has the same experience together. Those are the types of, of new behaviors we're going to see here to make sure people feel included. And disaggregating data is gonna be more important than ever. As we all experienced in our own way, these um, uh, COVID and racial reckoning awareness and other experiences happening right now, it's really made us aware of how important it is to be seen as individuals and in the differences that make up our diversity. So when you're in surveying folks, particularly on inclusion, it, your employees will likely be asking, in my opinion, they're gonna ask, so what is that like for caretakers? So what do the individuals who are currently in a hybrid situation um, feel? What is their inclusion? And that's gonna open up new doors to different data and disaggregation of data, like by gender. We may hear more about gender non-binary. We may hear more about different ethnicities or other historically marginalized groups outside of the United States and wanting to see data disaggregated in that way and affirming to the individual that they can um, define themselves the way that it, for the identity measures that are important to them right now and impact their experience. In diversity, you know, we we already heard from some of our, our folks on the the uh, conference today about the expanded recruiting pool. I think we all identified that uh, that wonderful opportunity right away, and I think it's important that that recruiting pool decision be thought of in the workforce plan. So not any job becomes open, but it's going to be important to get it up in the the decision making process as part of your location strategy. A lot of times we have location strategies that are focused on the financials of what does it cost to obtain talent in a certain region. And those are certainly important, but we now have an opportunity through the tools provided by places like Drop uh, to look at availability uh, and, and, and the cost in that location which is phenomenal. And it's gonna lead us to having to really examine our efficacy pool for the recruiting pipeline. So if we now have really great data on the availability of a location, then what does it look like for uh, the applications? Does it match? What does it look like for interviewing? And if you haven't done that funnel efficacy, it's going to be the min bar in the future, in my opinion. The equity is really exciting for me to think about because we're now expanding the scope of what we talk about when we talk about equity. We've been looking at people processes, pay equity being probably number one because of the legislature in some places. But we actually can now look at equity in terms of the resources being provided from our IT group, from our facilities. What does our workplace look like? What kinds of equipment do individuals have when they're working in these different situations? And how are we analyzing that data um, to ensure that everyone has what they need to reach their full potential? And that can expand to even things like budget. How are we making budgetary decisions? How are we making headcount decisions? All of those are resources that will help an individual to succeed in an organization and are primed for doing this kind of equity analysis in the future. 
And then lastly is the allyship. And I don't know about you, but I, was, I never thought I'd be a history professor, but I'm finding myself teaching a lot of history lessons now and trying to bridge the gap of knowledge uh, in terms of what has been happening in different regions of the world when it comes to marginalized groups. And that's becoming a min, a min bar again for folks that they want to, they expect their organizations to be providing them with learning opportunities and new measures of success in that way too, like network analysis. Can you show me um, um, some information about how I show up in the workplace? Who am I talking to? Who am I interacting with? Uh, so these are just my quick ideas um, from the framework of idea of what the future could look like here. And I'll just end with a little bit of inspiration because I, I one, I love this picture. Two, I get take any chance I can to quote Oprah. And she says, challenges are a gift that force us to a new center of gravity. Don't fight them. Just find a new way to stand. And I love that because we're all trying to just find a new way to stand. What is that new normal for the next, the next place we're going to be in when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And we'll add allyship into there now too. Thanks so much for letting me have the chance to speak with you about it. And thank you so much, Mary. So we have a question. Sean is asking, Remote work has dramatically reduced the human element in interactions and culture building within firms. Yes, we can agree with that. How can companies use technology to increase inclusion within their culture without losing the human element? That's a fantastic question. And I would say that the, you should be asking the employees for their ideas of what they want, because anything that we design should really take that human centered design approach. Um, and we do that with our external products. We should do that with our internal products as well. Um, ask people what they need. Ask them a little bit about the barriers that they see to make sure that what you are designing will work. We certainly have a lot of collaboration tools at our fingertips, but it can almost be overload if we don't ask people for the, the things that are most important for them to work with. So I'm going to refrain from answering it with a direct solution and instead say, I would, rec I would say you should ask your employees a little bit about what they would like to see. Good answer. Okay, next question from Maggie. She's wondering, what in your opinion is the impact remote working will have on an organization's prioritization of diversity and inclusion? I, I think what we're gonna see is that the, it's gonna be harder to obtain the objectives we were looking for when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So we're seeing already a drain in some of the workforce aspects. Women are being highly impacted around the world and dropping out of the workforce. Um, so we're seeing these, the um, urgency come up because of this um, and we're noticing it. And so it's making us take a, a stronger look at what will it take. At the same time, there's so many priorities happening right now as people are trying to survive the economic impact of what's been happening as well, that it will continue to take people speaking up and driving the diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, otherwise, people who fail to see it right now and try to address it later on are gonna be far too behind uh, on the eight ball to be able to catch up. Well, thank you again, Mary. We really appreciate your perspectives today. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, the end is, is coming here, but not quite. We've come to the last panel of the day. It could not be more power packed. So stay tuned. Digitalization is disrupting traditional roles and enterprises across the industries. Traditional roles are getting eliminated or transformed to accommodate new next generation skills and roles. Also, hiring for digital roles is highly competitive with huge supply demand gap, time and cost overheads, and scales heavily tilted towards hiring wrong candidate. Reskilling can enable enterprises to provide viable career path for their employees significantly improve employee satisfaction, as well as reduce their cost of hiring by 50 to 80 percent. DROP has mapped over 4 million career paths. 
and analyzed the Reskilling Propensity Index, RPI, for each role transformation. HR teams can identify most plausible short-term and long-term career trajectories for individual role, understand missing skills and certifications required for planned career progression, identify courses or certification offered by institutions or e-learning platforms to bridge the skill gaps, Drop is an AI-driven reskilling and talent intelligence platform that provides in-depth insights on the talent and location ecosystem to assist in enterprises in their talent initiatives. Next up, we have our final session for the day, an exciting panel discussion on reimagining employee experience in the hybrid workplace. This stellar panel of leaders will explore how to ensure employees' mental well-being, sustain a positive mindset, and provide maximum help to employees at the right time. Here to share their thoughts on leading your workforce during this transition are Jonathan Sidhart, CEO and co-founder of Touring, an automated platform that lets companies push a button to hire and manage remote developers. Then we have Richa Gupta, Chief People Officer at Cast Light Health. Richa has been in human resources for the last two decades, helping organizations create and unlock their talent strategies. Vibha Mishra, VP and HR Head, SAP, Silicon Valley, SAP, where uh, she champions people engagement, leadership development, people sustainability, and simplification. Vijay Shah, CEO and President at V2 Solutions. He has a penchant for building software products and platforms and was instrumental in launching India's first e-commerce platform, indiaplaza.com, two decades ago. And to moderate this session, we have Vamsi Tarukala, Chief Commercial Officer and Co-Founder of Drop. He brings a wealth of experience in launching products, market development, and has led numerous customer engagements across the globe. Over to you, Vamsi. Thank you, Amy. Uh, it was a wonderful session so far. And uh, hello, everyone. I think as uh, Amy was talking about, we are almost at the final stages of the conference, but we, trust me, we have the best for the last, right? So it's going to be a very exciting panel today. And uh, I know that most of us have celebrated the forgettable anniversary of the pandemic. I think this has by far been one of the pivotal events of all our professional lives. And uh, as you could, uh, you know, as you heard many of our speakers speak, uh, talk today on how they have to transform their workplace, how they have to reimagine their, uh, you know, employee engagements or employee experiences, how they manage their, not only employees, but their business, everything is changed today. But Today, in this panel, we are primarily going to focus on employee engagement. I know uh, earlier in uh, a part of the conference, both uh, Jason and Rohan talked a little bit about the uh, employee experience, especially when employees are all either remote or we are coming towards some kind of a hybrid workplace. Uh, and we will ask the panelists what they think. Is it all going to be remote? Or are we going to be back to the pre-pandemic normal, or are we going to have some kind of a hybrid in between there? So we'll, we'll start with there. But before that, I just want to say that we are so honored to have all these panelists here. I mean, like we have, this is the probably the most diverse set of panelists that we can get uh, for, this, uh, for this topic. Uh, we have practitioners, we have managers who are the, we have the people who are uh, leaders of this change management. So uh, with that, uh, you know, actually, Richard, let me start with you. I mean, like, uh, how, do you, how did 2020 go and how is 2021 coming along for you? Exactly. Well, thank you, uh, Vamsi and Zeno, first of all, for the opportunity for giving us a platform to, to make our voices uh, be heard. Uh, 2020, if you look at it in the rear view mirror, uh, what I saw, Vamsi, personally was misery and suffering at scale. 
we can all pause and just look at the kind of enormity of what has happened, 2.5 plus million deaths, right, globally so far. Uh, so it has been it has been really tough. But on the positive, and we also have seen a lot of communities at scale, like cultures and countries and communities coming together to solve for what is not a local problem, right? It's a global problem needing a global solution. We also saw innovation at scale. So a lot of kind of creative ways of doing the work, the new habits, um, the digitization of the companies got accelerated by about five years. So that's, you know, when I look at 2020 in the rear view mirror, that's what I see. Excellent. So let's go to Viba, but on a different top, uh, you know, similar topic, but different question. What, what did you see? I mean, like you guys are as global as anyone in this room are, right? So, um, are there any nuances that you saw regionally or globally, Viva? Uh, good question, Mamsi. And first of all, thanks for the question and thanks for having me here. Uh, in terms of the nuances, and you're right, we, uh, we have various offices around the globe, uh, but the priorities more or less were similar, right? So first priority for every one of us across the globe in every office was employee safety and well-being, giving a sense of uh, to our employees of support and helping them adjust to the new normal, which included like pandemic leaves. And most of the regions came up with uh, things like that, wellness apps. We, in fact, um, are actually uh, April 27th, we are coming up with a, a health day where we are giving off to employees globally, right? So I think that was the priority. And if you ask me about experiences across, I would say more or less it was the same, though the offices were in a, in a different status, I would say, because of course the stage was different uh, in various locations, but the common threads were the same, the need to collaborate, the human need to be in touch with the other people, I would say was the same across locations. Excellent, thanks you. Moving on to Vijay. Vijay, I know you, you have very diversity of experience. I mean, like you have, and you are also a you know, much smaller company compared to the you know, others uh, in the panel. How, what are some of the unique things that you have uh, observed, Vijay, uh, in terms of the employee engagement or experiences in the past one year? I would say it's the readiness, right? I mean, uh, for me, this is probably the fourth, um, the fourth um, change I've seen in the globe, uh, starting with the 1990 earthquake in Rodney Kings when I was in LA, the middle of the earthquake, having a four inch crack through our businesses go through when I was 16 years old to seeing the whole dot-com bust and the 2008 that we saw. And one thing I recognize in all of this, being through all of these different change is that it's actually, um, the game is the same. The only thing that's changed is the playing field. Yeah. You know, you end up landing in a new territory and the rain is different, the pitch is different. That's actually what is happening, right? And what we've trained for within our ecosystem is how to play the sport at its best when the times are changing, right? Sure. And I think this has been an opportunity actually for great new players to evolve, for yeah. them to really shine in a new light overall. So that opportunity has uh, become so visible and um, you know, discoveries that we would never have made have expedited. Individuals that were that you thought were passive have become remarkable leaders that have become very vocal. So you've seen such a plethora of um, evolution and change uh, expedite through. And I would say as an organization, for us, it's been about calmness. Can we be calm and not add to the anxiety, add to the worry, but really allow our players of the sports team that we are part of, right? Which is a great play and let them become the leaders because they're not on the field playing the game, pitching the bat, right? We as coaches are on the sideline sort of giving, giving the cheer up. So for us, I think it's been about that uh, as a whole overall, right? Excellent. I, I think that's a great point, which I, uh, you know, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, Jonathan, your situation is very unique compared to anyone, right? You are remote. Like the entire organization is remote, right? So what, I mean, like, did you guys even feel anything or did you have to change anything? So how did you handle the situation? Yeah, uh, firstly, thank you Zanab for putting together this panel and for having me. Um, I think there's been a lot of change in the, in the last year. And I emphasize that by saying, um, I mean, a little more than 10 years ago, we used to call these uh, smartphones uh, today, yeah. we just call them phones. 
Uh, I think the big shift is uh, uh, remote work. All work will be remote work going forward. All teams will be distributed teams um, and sometimes globally distributed teams. And the new normal is teams or distributed teams work is going to be remote or a hybrid of remote. And in that new normal, the three things people have to keep in mind in, 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 in my experience, both at Turing and what we see in our customers is number one, communication, uh, over communicate and have with an emphasis on asynchronous communication. Number two, consistency. I, I heard uh, Richa and Viva also talk about creating a level playing field. I, I, I mean, making sure that you don't have double standards in your team for who's remote versus who's, lo who's, uh, who's local. So consistent communication. Uh, and the third is uh, building the um, importance of having a great culture that where mm -hmm. people feel more connected uh, to each other. Uh, I think Vibha mentioned um, the need to communicate and collaborate. And I think that's more important uh, than ever. Um, ah. So communication, consistency, and culture is, is what I see as things to double down in this new normal. Excellent. Excellent points there, uh, Jonathan. So Vibha, let me come to you on a completely different topic. I think you know, when you went from this, you know, slightly, you know, a, a small percentage of the employees being remote to a large percentage of them being remote and probably like somewhere in between the hybrid uh, workplace evolving, what are some of the major process changes that you have to design, uh, Viba? And what, what was the, uh, again, the change management, where, where were the biggest pain points for you? Um, good question. And when I reflect on 2020, I think we were one of the first offices to close uh, in Bay Area, basically, and we did it in one evening. We decided uh, that that's the best thing to do for our employees. So honestly, we were not the best prepared when we took this decision, but it was, in hindsight, it was the best decision at that point of time. So coming to what are the challenges? So once, the, I think the closing was the easiest thing to do. The challenges were... Uh, people did not have a uh, heads up to take the equipment back home. I would say mm -hmm. that's the thing, right? So initially for us, it was, like I said earlier, employee safety and well-being was important. That's why we took this decision. Second priority for us was to ensure that employees have the equipment with them have uh, so that they can be productive, right? And work from home because we did uh, envision that this would be a long-term thing and it was not going away in a couple of months. So what yeah. we did was uh, when the things became a bit better, we did a drive uh, where employees can could come to office and collect whatever equipments they wanted, including their chairs. It was a humongous task to do with 4,000 employees here, uh, but we managed uh, to do that in a very seamless fashion. And I would say the third thing for us was, how do we start building communities, right? What about, uh, what about our, the, uh, the benefits policies? So of course, with, uh, with the community building, we started going virtual. We in fact reimagined our summer party as well because earlier it was in person and we thought we need to bring people together. So we did a virtual summer party where we asked people to form teams and they could uh, maybe, uh, do painting together or actually even play a virtual reality game together. So those are some of the things we did. Of course, benefits, there were certain state laws which we had to uh, uh, abide by as well. So. Uh, so those changes we did, but mostly in terms of benefits, I would say because we were always in this mode, so the benefits changes were not that much at that point of time, but processes yeah. definitely. Good. Um, Richa, a slightly different question for you. You are in an industry, or even the, the role before this also is in an industry that is like highly regulated. That means that there is a lot of confidentiality that comes with it, a lot of privacy that comes with it. Are there any specific changes that you need to make at the same time not to kind of impact the experience of an, of an employee or how they engage with not only their leaders, but also their collaborators, right? So how do you, uh, you, know, how do you manage that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and fortunately, um, it did not come in the way. 
right? Okay. So most of our, our compliance work, the regulatory laws were well understood and employees just abided by those. We have, you know, IT rules and access restrictions in place. Um, so no matter which location the employee sat in or even at home, um, none of that uh, was impacted. Um, now we have our, at Castlight, um, our call center uh, that is still um, operational in person. Um, and those are some of the roles where um, we call them care guides. They're, they're benefits specialists and, um, and actual nurses who, um, you know, based on the business that we do, we are actually in the business of making healthier, happier, and more productive lives in the care navigation. So there's always a lot of calls from users and their families on how do I read my, my claims data? How, do, how can you help me get to the right solution? So all of the protocols on how the care guides are supposed to have those interactions and, and really share the information are in place. So I wouldn't say COVID really impacted the way we went about our, our compliance and governance rules. Okay, so you don't have to change any uh, changes even for like a cross business unit communications or cross team communications or how do, do they, you provide the transparency for the employees or any of them? Same rules apply, we okay. just went digital. Okay, perfect, perfect. Which is a different question for you. Let's go into a different topic in the interest of time. How, you know, what are the, are, they, are you using any digital tools now? Uh, because now everybody is at least, you know, remote or going to be remote partially. Um, do you, you know, are there any tools or technologies that they, uh, that you use that actually made a lot more impact for you, uh, than when you are all in the office? You know, um, Bamsi, thanks for that. And thanks for the opportunity over here to be here because it's a topic very dear, right? And I talk about this whole theme around sports and players and when the playing field changes, what happens? Anxiety levels go up. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to the customer? You know, I'm not able to be as productive. What's going to occur, right? And we launched one tool and one very most important tool. And it's the FSAT tool. Hmm. So far, we've heard about the ESAT. We've heard about yep. the CSAT, right? Customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction. But I think this changing norm, the only way we can measure whether our, our team had anxiety or not, or whether things were normal or not, or the productivity is happening or not, was to the FSAT score. Family satisfaction. <laughs> family satisfaction. Okay. We ran a survey for all family members to vote. Not, employees don't have a say. The family okay. members have a say to inform us how the people are doing. Because if an individual is balanced at home, he's calm at home, he's not yelling at the kids saying, I've got work to do, I've got to report on something, then we know they're not going to make the errors. We know they're going to be innovative. We're not going to, we know they're going to think on the behalf of our customers and our clients are going through this crisis. So I would say that was one of the biggest changes that we made. And we launched a leadership CEO dashboard through which regular surveys would happen. And there would be indications and all our, all our questions were always put into measuring anxiety levels of a human being, right? So okay. I would say that's one of the tools that we launched. And I think it's been a remarkable success. Um, and the embracement that we've seen people come together with has been unbelievable, unbelievable. That, that, that's, that's a very, very unique thing that we ever heard, which I so thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. Um, Jonathan, uh, same question from a different perspective. When employees are all remote uh, or mostly remote, what are some of the new things you are measuring or monitoring and, uh, and how is it valuable? Uh, great question. So when employees are remote or fully remote, what are the new things that we that we measure? Um, I would say when you're uh, when you're operating as a remote distributed team, the most important thing is uh, c communication and asynchronous communication. And it starts on day one. So when we on onboard a new person to a fully distributed team, um, like at Turing, we have a very detailed onboarding process where we make sure that the person receives uh, organizational context. Okay, here is the company, here are the different teams, here is the person responsible for uh, each team, what metrics they care about, how those teams connect with each other, the org chart, what are the company's priorities quarter by quarter. We write it down and share it. And it's, it's so powerful, it, writing things down is just so powerful. So, uh, and our reason for doing this is we don't want people to be stuck in Slack prisons. Like 
too often somebody's like on some Slack channel somewhere, they don't know what's happening in other parts of the company. So we over communicate uh, stuff like this. So we make sure people receive organizational um, context. Uh, we make sure that Turing's, like our company's core values are written down and people understand it. And we ask, we give somebody a buddy for the first three months. We, we have somebody onboarding. Here are four people in the company you should speak with in the first month to fully ramp up. Got it. So that onboarding process has to be very detailed. And then you need frequent checkpoints. So we have um, our OKRs are, are, uh, are reviewed weekly and shared publicly company-wide. Uh, mm-hmm. So periodic follow through on, um, on, on communication. Um, there's one thing my mentor at GitLab uh, taught me, which was whenever somebody asks a question, the answer should be a link versus somebody answering, which means you've written it down. Right. The first time it can be a verbal response, but then you write it down. There's a link that's documented. So it kind of holds up, holds up over time. Um, I would say in addition to the tools, and I loved VJ's FSAT tool. I, I think we should, we should try that at Turing. Um, in addition to tools, I would say it's the way you use the tools. Like the, it, it's quick feedback loops, uh, consistent follow-up. And I would encourage, uh, I encourage all my teams to have in-person meetings where it's safe to do so. So remote does not mean you never meet and you're always in Zoom. So in some, some of our teams occasionally have walking meetings, socially distanced, if they feel comfortable doing that. So, so I think those are, uh, those are, those are very important. Um, if I had to pick one thing, it would be relying on asynchronous communication uh, for decision making and meetings and minimizing in-person meetings as much as possible. That's a, yeah, that's that's great uh, segue to the next topic that uh, we're going to come uh, ask you is, uh, you know, one thing is about the communication at the end of the day, it is about the leadership and the change management, right? So how important it is for the leaders to plan and manage and monitor and proactively communicate and all that stuff. I mean, like we have heard bits and pieces of it, but from your perspective, what are some of the unique things or best practices that companies should adopt? Um, I, I would say communication is the key to any successful change management, right? So, so communication is definitely important, but we have a big opportunity in front of us, and that is to do something for the long term and prepare the organization for future. I think that's how the leaders should look at it. It should be a more long-term approach. And coming to communication, of course, like I said, it's important. It's important to be Uh, not just communicate, but communicate truthfully to be transparent to the employees and set the right expectations as to what works for the organization and what does not work for them. Because Mm -hmm. every team has different nuances. And we know, though we are talking about hybrid model, remote work, not all the teams would be remote, right? Because there are certain roles which need to be in office. So how can you be inclusive to them? I think hmm. those are some of the questions the leaders uh, should uh, should ask and build a culture which is based on, I would say, transparency and trust, because I think that will help the teams be successful in future. And I also feel that each team to be successful in the hybrid model needs to come with their own set of best practices, which okay. may include having their own guidelines, um, coming to office, having collaboration mediums that can include coming to office, say, two days in a week where the entire team is together, just for collaboration purposes, have set rules around the meetings, how they give updates, and how they even recognize each other, right? Because if you want collaboration and unity, those are some of the important things. and. F- The last I would say for me, what is extremely important is to have a psychological safety in the team, right? A a safe space for people to provide their opinions and help each other and build on um, each other's ideas. Excellent, excellent. Uh, In the interest of time, which I'm going to ask you a completely different question. Uh, It's about remoteness and lack of empathy. Right. I mean, like at least perceived lack of empathy. How do you how do you handle those things? I mean, like, you know, when everybody is in the same room, you meet them, see them all the time itself. People think that there is lack of empathy in the organization. And when you are always remote or mostly remote, you know, that's going to absolutely that's a big challenge. So how how are you handling that? Absolutely. And I think um, 
we think it needs to be different or the approach needs to be different when you, you're remote versus person, but it's actually not. I think this time last year really showed us how fundamental and simple the art of leadership is and should be, right? So whether you are in person with somebody in the room or on the phone, intentionally asking the question of how are you doing? Now, how different is it from being in person versus over the phone? As, as long as you really mean it, right? Mm -hmm. So one concept that I've really learned um, and taught my managers is the concept of wise compassion, right? Mm -hmm. The economy um, went through some complex changes. The transformation is still on. We don't have a day to skip the beat, right? Or take a rest from this thing. So we have to keep the work going. In addition to that, we have to keep the people going. So how do you get tough things done in a human way is the concept of wise compassion. So just, you know, be human, still give the feedback, the constructive feedback that you need to give your people, but actually be truly mindfully, authentically be invested in their holistic well-being is the key to it. And it doesn't matter. Remote does not play a role into it. I mean, you can be the, on the phone and still be have the same level of empathy as you would in the room. So how do you inculcate that across your organization, Rich? I, I know some people are natural. Some people need mentoring. Some leaders are, you know, just need to be taught. So how do you enable that? Absolutely. I mean, training does play a big role into it, okay. but I was having a manager connection circle at Castlight a few weeks ago, and some managers told me that, you know what, we weren't ready for it, but the time really forced it on us and we didn't have a choice. So we mm. didn't leave with a choice. And as Vipa was saying, who had the time to prepare anybody to deal with anything, right? A lot of us had to really jump in and learn it as we went. And we did great. You know, if you look back, most of it, us did great and it kind of speaks to the, the resilience. But then there are, of course, programmatic tools. We have done a lot of training. We have opened a lot of forums for open conversations so the managers can come in and learn from, uh, from each other. And then they learn through their own experiences and shared back. So we have put a lot of kind of programs in place, but I think this thing also happened very organically where we were all thrown into it and had to learn to swim um, and how to be empathetic and how to also be great managers and keep the growth going. Excellent, excellent. There is a couple of questions I want to ask, but before that, there are a couple of questions from the audience. I thought one of them, you know, both of them are interesting, but one of them is really, really, I'm also curious about it. I think this is, this is a question actually for you, Vijay, uh, from Nivedita, uh, asking, you know, this is a great initiative, brilliant. Uh, can you share some of the metrics that you measure for the FSAC? So, you know, it's, it's a wonderful question, right? So work hours, right? How much are people working? Number one. Number two, okay. we look at how much are people celebrating? I, I think it's been one of our themes inside the organization, but outside, you know, mm -hmm. if people are celebrating, it's a very strong indication of a person's state of mind, right? Sure. And one of our themes across the span of years has been no surprises, celebrate success, right? Sure. And what is the first thing that happens when a pandemic happens or something? People stop celebrating. Hmm. You know, we, we start saying, well, it's not the time to celebrate. And if you stop celebrating, then life is not a joy. You're not playing the field. You're not playing the game, right? So, you know, are those small moments and occasions still being celebrated? And I think we focused on many of these factors, but I would say we focused, if you were to say, of all the metrics that we were running around, celebration was one of the ones we looked at the anniversaries, the birthdays, you know, the small events, people are going through educational challenges, right? Um, being together, you know, the amount of notes that we continue to get around this time that, you know, for the first time in years, I'm celebrating my birthday with my mother, right? Because a lot of people are working, have moved away and other things that people have moved back to the workplaces. So I would say, you know, when we look at it, we look at the human elements of a person and a being as a whole overall, right? And celebration, I would say, was one of our biggest measures of, uh, of takeaways. Absolutely. We will remember that, uh, Vijay. And uh, we should, I think, uh, you know, people always talk that, hey, it's been a busy year. We need to take a break, but somehow we never take that very seriously. So that's yes. great to know that you're actually measuring it. So life is a joy and every moment is worth living, right? So exactly, exactly. So there is one other question from Robert who's asking like, uh, you know, how do you hire in a remote world? Uh, what are the most effective strategies? So uh, I don't know who wants to take that. Uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan, let's go with you. 
Yeah. So um, I, I think we are living in an incredible time where it's now normal to look to hire the best people in the world, not the best people who happen to live near our office, right? Okay. And when you, if you're hiring in a remote first world, I would say um, it's important to um, look in um, countries and geographies where there is high quality talent, uh, but okay. not enough local opportunity. Uh, and there are many, many like, like for example, for engineering, um, we find incredibly amazing engineers in uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Cent uh, South America, Southeast Asia, parts of Africa. Africa is becoming huge for engineering talent. So there's great people all over the world. You just need to have a data-driven process where you can evaluate a really large top of the funnel. The, the challenge with hiring remotely is you won't recognize the schools. If you're hiring a great engineer from Sao Paulo, Brazil, you may not see Stanford, Berkeley on the resume. You won't see Google, Facebook, Stripe in their work experience. But these are incredibly great people. So you can't filter by resume or a LinkedIn profile. You have to assess through lightweight technical tests or screening that you can do, which creates a level playing field. Actually, we find testing to be very fair in terms of elimination of bias. Like we don't care what people look like or sound like. We just care whether they can do the job. So creating lightweight tests that can be done asynchronously, like say five hour tests, 10 hour tests, that really helps. And you also have to make sure that is adequate time zone overlap. So look in geographies where there's at least, we find four hours of overlap to be sufficient. And if your organization okay. has gone fully async, you, you might even be get away with no time zones uh, because okay. everything is documented. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. So a uh, couple of uh, very quick uh, comments, if you can make, Viba. How do you build and uh, uh, nurture organization culture? What are the things that you have done? I'm mean, like other, apart from some of the best practices that you have shared, are there anything that you do specifically to, uh, to, to kind of focus on organization culture? Yeah, of course. And um, I think the organization culture is basically built on the behaviors that you want uh, the people in the organization to follow. So we do have organizational behaviors defined um, and uh, that is something we talk at every opportunity. Our reward system is related to that. Um, and uh, also, for example, uh, we ha do have our employee surveys. So um, as we, we, uh, we were hearing about the various surveys, right? So we do have an employee survey where we, the manager gets a trust score. Uh, which yeah. is actually defined by one question. So it's a pretty tough job <laughs> of, um, to get a good score on that. And also that is where we check on these behaviors, whether they are being followed by the leaders themselves, first of all, yeah. right? Because the, you, the leaders have to live it to show it for the teams to follow. So uh, through that mechanism also, we try to build the behaviors and which in turn helps us uh, build a culture for the organization, but, and it also ties with the vision, right? Like uh, uh, giving back to society, which is very big for SAP. And I think any person you speak to SAP, it would just run in the DNA <laughs> because okay. that's the vision and the, the purpose as well. Excellent, excellent. Thanks. Ruth. One last question to you, Richard. I mean, like, you know, when everybody is remote, nobody, you know, many of them are not going to meet each other, but they are going to collaborate. They are going to work together. In those cases, how do you ensure that there is a healthy communication between the teams and individuals? Absolutely. And what came to our rescue, Vamsi, was the concept of community. And that, um, in a way, answers the question that you were asking, Bibha, yeah. around how you keep the culture alive is through the community. So what we did was, again, digitally connecting people on common causes be it volunteering or team project, you know, and, and last year, in the second half of last year, we actually in the entirely virtual world took an opportunity to refresh our values. Times are changing, values were set two years ago. What needs to be different? And we pulled the employees in to reshape what the values needed to look like. A lot of um, virtual communities, again, purpose-based communities around company projects, et cetera. And Castlight, I mean, given the place where, where we are, we organically had the opportunities to contribute more broadly uh, to the COVID time. So a lot of kind of purpose-driven work around 
designing test site finders. And, and now we are working with CDC on vaccine finders, right? So there's, you know, naturally there's a lot of work that is broadly socially meaningful. So aligning employees to the purpose of the company, constantly communicating with, you know, what that needs to look like and how our day-to-day -day work aligns with the bigger, uh, bigger cause and purpose here, the community-based communication all digitally. Communication has been really important. So we went from um, a, a monthly uh, all hands to every other week all hands where our CEO shows up, there is no mess, right? And the leadership team communicating, updating the SharePoints, the newsletters, the blogs, the emails, the slacks, firing on all channels and it, it, it works. So I think uh, this yeah. time if anything else has busted the myth that we need to see each other every single day to be effective, to be communicative. Uh, so, you know, the virtual communities really, really have come to our rescue. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I know Richa, Vibha, uh, Vijay, and Jonathan can't ask you for a better panel to uh, discuss these things. And thank you for sharing all your point of views and more importantly, your experiences and your guidance. Right? So I know there's uh, years and years worth of uh, you know, um, you know, <laughs> guidance that you can give and uh, through your experience. It's just that we absolutely ran out of time. So we are uh, going to, you know, again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, end the panel discussion here. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a rich discussion, truly. That was fantastic. All right, hold on everyone. We have come to the end of a stellar lineup of speakers and sessions, but stay tuned for the closing remarks after this. come to the end of this year's U.S. edition of Zinov Confluence 2021, I'd like to call upon Sangeeta Anand, principal at Zinov, to summarize the sessions. Sangeeta comes with 20 plus years of experience in the IT industry, and among other things, she helps companies create high-performing global teams. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be closing the NOS 2021 Confluence. It's been a two days of exciting discussions of the most relevant topics that is on like every CXO, every leader's mind, uh, you know, the global growth wars. What is the new normal? How long is this going to last? Is this here to stay? Or is this a new opportunity that we have to grab it by the horns, right? And at the end of this exciting two days, hope you all got several thought bites to carry with you from here, several data points, several insights, several thoughts, ideas that are relevant to your organization, to your workforce, your future plans, and for your business ideas. And for day two, day one was exciting and we had a whole gamut of discussions on the global growth bars and what's the new normal looking like, uh, the advent of AI and automation space, et cetera. And day two has been all about talent and how do we uh, you know, address the talent needs? How do we build leaders of the future? How do we work in the new normal? What tools do we provide our workforce and 
disciplines? How do we upskill them? What about diversity, inclusion? How about empathy-based leadership, right? So we have been talking about all of this today, some of my very favorite topics, and uh, it's been very exciting uh, day two. The day started off with a fantastic keynote by Vijay Swami, who talked about how AI is like slowly replacing many of the jobs, but and there are utility jobs that are getting quickly replaced and what kind of roles can be put in to you know help the companies win this growth wars but there's still some high touch jobs that cannot re be replaced by ai like your caregivers your janitors too and you know, we have to just you know accept that but then there is the middle layer and how do we address that middle layer and he brought out three very important points about having a dynamic job architecture, identifying new roles that was not existent previously, like your communication specialist, your uh, strategy specialist, and your um, risk-taking uh, skills and all of that. So we have to identify them and we have to train some of the talents to grow into this new space. How do we upskill and reskill these talents and put company learning orbit? How do you boost self-belief? How do you help the people understand that they can also, you know, adapt to this new uh, space and learn these much needed skills. How can a, a BA of today become an automation QA of the future, right? And why inclusion is very, very important and how that has to start from the beginning. He set the pace so well for every future discussions that came about and every other discussion built on that. And we quickly jumped on to the panel discussion that was efficiently led by Siddharth, Siddharth Rastogi, and was joined by um, Rohan Chandran from Data Axel and Ajay from Tech Mahindra, who with their very wide experience gave us a big perspective on the leadership why leadership matters and how important it is in the changing landscape of working remotely. And Rohan talked about his challenges with building a brand new center in Pune and everything had to be done virtually and remotely, including hiring the center head, which is a huge challenge that you know nobody would have had in the past and having to do something which is a key role and having to do all of that remotely was such a challenge and we benefited from hearing some of the uh, tips and you know thoughts that went into his uh, way of recruiting that key talent and how he had to finally rely on his intuition as well in finally making the call on who that could be and how he can see what the competition is, what is the landscape of competition and how it is very important to build a leader that is no longer on the command and control, but it's more of the delegatory leadership who's very uh, key on you know, communication being the key factor in identifying the right leader. Ajay came uh, to us with a whole gamut of quotes and interesting anecdotes, um, you know, starting from the race cars field to saying that that is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us and we have to look at it that way. And to the example of bees and flies and how both of that is very much needed in an organization. While we need more flies, we definitely do need our, our bees as well. And, uh, you know, we have to have, um, good communication and why that is so important right now it's not the verbal communication it is important verbal communication is important but we also have to look for non-verbal communications and make sure that every employee every leader is trained and you know uh, prepared for that non-verbal communication and then we moved on to jason who also now touched upon how important it is to build high performing team and, but how do you do that? You need the right tools and right, uh, you know, right training to enable that. And he gave us examples of how this can be tackled in a hybrid workplace. This work from home model is here to stay. People are liking it. People are much more effective, much more productive. We will see a hybrid model where you will have some days people come into the office, but many days they stay remotely at home. So then how do you enable them? How do you enable them with the right set of tools? How do you boost their morality? How do you boost their loyalty, retention, and trust? And how do you build a very level playing field for every employee to be able to be successful? And he gave us uh, excellent tips on how that can be done. We moved on to inclusion, which was touched upon by everybody that talked, uh, you know, starting from Vijay to Jason and every panelist, they talked about the 
importance of inclusion. And Mary from F5 gave us very interesting tips using the concept of idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and allyship, and how we can use this concept to build upon you know, the right talent pool, how do you hire for the right talent pool? How do you build the career path for them? Why resources are like equity? Why we have to look at what we are building today as an equity and why we need to provide them with the right opportunities and information so that they can grow very well in the organization and why it is very important to have a good feedback loop and why it is important to listen and learn and why we have to be a partner for our employees. And after that wonderful insight by Mary, we had a vibrant panel discussion that was led by an equally vibrant uh, pan, um, moderator, Vamsi, and uh, Richa and Viba talked about and expanded on the concept of empathy-based leadership. We had so much insights coming from Richa on what Castlight has done in order to help support the communication aspect of it, in order to build communities that, you know, this is no longer a workplace. It's about all about communities. And it's no longer about location. It's all about communities. And how do we build that? We have to identify the right opportunities. We have to double up on our efforts on nonverbal communication blogs, having much more weekly, uh, you know, um, uh, town halls and uh, providing opportunities for volunteering, providing forums for employees to be more proactive, providing the right kind of tools for them to, you know, uh, be able to become much more effective in their workforce. And also, um, which I rightly talked about how we have to celebrate success, how every small wins is very important. You know, in the past, nobody was giving a big, uh, a deal about the anniversary, the first year anniversary, the fifth year anniversary. Now a big deal is being done about every single milestone because that's the only way we can connect and uh, you know build bonds among the team. So he rightly talked about all of this. And then Jonathan ha helped us talk about what does need to be measured and how communication also can be a key thing that can be measured. And also how we need to create a very safe workplace and how it is important to focus on creating a good quality OKRs that can measure the how we are doing well in this, uh, you know, the new ways of working. And I, I think the key theme that everybody resonated with and everybody talked about was once again about the empathy based leadership and why it is so important for every leader while they were not very prepared, while they didn't know what hit them, while they didn't learn or had an opportunity to train on something like this, because like what Rohan said, you know, this didn't happen in 1918. Nobody had a manual for this. So, um, you know, everybody was just thrown in, but we have been resilient. We have learned, we have learned on the job and we all, all have taken a different personality that can help us navigate through. And I have absolutely no doubt and no uh, second thought that we will continue to be successful. And I do see that every company has learned how to be resilient and how they can tackle this growth wars. So thank you so much for all of the wonderful discussions. And I would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Accenture, Drop, and Virtuosa, and also thank our gold, and gold partners, Tech Mahindra and V2 Solutions. While the US Confluence is coming to an end, I would, I'm very excited to announce that we have our India Confluence all scheduled and all set for 6th through 9th of July, 2021. It's a four days of exciting conversations, over 100 plus speakers, 6,000 plus attendees, 800 plus companies, and four exciting tracks. We will all see you again in the India version of the Confluence. And until then, keep celebrating every success and every milestone and stay happy. Life is a joy. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you for that summary. And thank you all for joining us for this year's US edition of Zinov Confluence, Winning the Growth Wars, the Technology and Talent Blueprint in the New Normal. And we will see you again in July 2021 for the Indian edition of Zinov Confluence. And we'll send even more details in the future. 
Well, for now, that's all from us here at Zenov. This is your host, Amy McWhorter, signing off. I look forward to staying in touch with those who have connected on LinkedIn. Stay safe and have a good rest of your day or night. With a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe, seismic or small. It continues. Change is all around us, shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. Digitalization is disrupting traditional roles and enterprises across the industries. Traditional roles are getting eliminated or transformed to accommodate new next generation skills and roles. Also, hiring for digital roles is highly competitive with huge supply demand gap, time and cost overheads, and scales heavily tilted towards hiring wrong candidate. Reskilling can enable enterprises to provide viable career path for their employees significantly improve employee satisfaction, as well as reduce their cost of hiring by 50 to 80 percent. Drop has mapped over 4 million career paths and analyzed the Reskilling Propensity Index, RPI, for each role transformation. HR teams can identify most plausible short-term and long-term career trajectories for individual roles understand missing skills and certifications required for planned career progression. Identify courses or certification offered by institutions or e-learning platforms to bridge the skill gaps. DROP is an AI-driven reskilling and talent intelligence platform that provides in-depth insights on the talent and location ecosystem to assist in enterprises in their talent initiatives. Speed is the new currency of business. In the new digital economy, effective competition requires a balanced approach to deep digital transformation that drives direct business value. By combining frictionless technology delivery with deep industry expertise, Virtusa helps business move forward faster. We help our clients advance to their optimal business state and achieve quick and continuous return on their investments. Virtusa is an end-to-end -end provider, delivering the full spectrum of technology services for our clients. For us, over the years, our mantra has become very, very um, ingrained in what we do, and it's three words. One team, one effort, one win. How are we one unified force? When we talk about one team, what makes one team? And we'll obviously think about, okay, the vibrance probably make one team, but it's three parts to it. 
it's us as leadership it's our team who are the vibrance and it's our customers and our clients who are our partners collectively we make one